Early on the 2nd of February 1964, Oersman spotted a woman's body by Hammersmith Bridge. The cross marked the precise spot. By establishing the rise and fall of the river, police calculated that the body had been thrown in 24 hours earlier from Duke's Meadow, which borders the Thames half a mile upstream. This is an area of parkland in Chiswick with sports fields. It also has a riverside walk, which was popular with courting couples and as a nighttime haunt for prostitutes with their clients. The police soon put a name to the woman, Hannah Tailford, streetwalker, missing for 10 days, pregnant with her third child. In 1964, London was acquiring its reputation as a swinging city in which society was changing rapidly and rigid morality was loosening. Business girls, as they called themselves, patrolled the streets the Bayswater Road, which runs along the north side of Hyde Park, was a popular hunting ground for the girls and their clients. It was here that Hannah Tailford sought her customers. Prettier than this photograph suggests, she was only a mere five foot two, a fact that was later to become significant. When she was found in the river, she was naked except for her stockings, which were round her ankles. Some cloth had been stuffed into her mouth. All her other clothes had disappeared, along with her handbag. Although she had been dead for less than 24 hours, the exact cause of death was never established. She did have head injuries, but other tests suggested that she might have been drowned already, perhaps in a bath, before going in the river. The inquest at Ealing Coroner's Court returned an open verdict. It could have been suicide. A hundred suicides are pulled from the Thames each year. But murder seemed more likely when, two months later, a second body was found on the shore below Duke's Meadow. The cross again marks the spot. Like the first victim, the girl had been assaulted somewhere else before she died and her body carried to the river. Like the first victim, 26-year-old Irene Lockwood was on the game frequented Bayswater Road, was only five feet in height, and had been strangled. Like the first victim, she was pregnant when she was killed, and both were found on the foreshore without any clothes on. For the police, both the locations and the similarities tied the murders together. Like Hannah Tailford, Irene Lockwood had come up from the country, Lincolnshire, she had appeared in blue films as well as working the streets. Now the papers sniffed a big story. The name Jack the Stripper was their inspiration when they realized that a killer of prostitutes was on the prowl, echoing London's most famous murderer. The ladies of the night continued working, but with more fear than usual. Violence is always part of their life as Irene well knew. Her flatmate had been battered to death only a few months before. Then, just two weeks after Irene's murder, the body of a third victim was found dumped in an alleyway off Swinkham Avenue in Brentford, a couple of miles from Duke's Meadow. She had also been strangled, but three of her front teeth were missing as well. The alleyway is quiet, but surrounded by buildings. The girl's name was Teddy, actually Helen Bartholomew, aged 22. She was also a prostitute who worked the same district to attract her clients. Two detective superintendents were added to the investigators, Bill Baldock to concentrate on the Bartholomew case and Morris Osborne to coordinate all three inquiries.
they ordered a painstaking sifting of every square inch of the back alley where the body was found. Unlike the first victims, Teddy had not been immersed in water, so forensic scientists were able to discover two vital facts. She had swallowed sperm. This shed a new light on the missing front teeth, which had been forced out after death. And she had tiny specks of paint on her skin. As the police set up another incident room, they had to acknowledge that the killer had shown remarkable coolness bringing the body to such a public spot. Teddy Bartholomew had been born in Scotland and educated in a convent. Rebelling, she had run away to Blackpool, where she became a stripper on the Golden Mile. It was a small step to prostitution and a move to London. Soho became her hunting ground, petty criminals her companions. Three days later came a sensational development. Into Notting Hill Police Station walked a man called Kenneth Archibald, who had run a drinking club. A card for the club had been found in Irene Lockwood's flat. He told the sergeant, I killed her. He said he had picked her up at a pub, driven to open land near Barnesbridge, and quarrelled about money. He had strangled her, and then undressed her body and rolled her into the river. Solely on the basis of his confession, he was charged with the murder of Irene Lockwood. But at the Old Bailey, he changed his story and pleaded not guilty. He said that he was drunk when he confessed, and the jury took less than an hour to acquit him. Few of the detectives were surprised, since Archibald had had watertight alibis for the other two murders. So Scotland Yard redoubled its efforts as it became obvious that a multiple killer was on the loose. Extra staff were brought in to test every scrap of material evidence. The most hopeful lead seemed to be the minute paint flecks found by forensic examination, which suggested that the body had been hidden near a workshop with a high-pressure paint sprayer. Police went back over their files to see if any outstanding, unexplained deaths could be the work of the same killer. They came to the conclusion that at least two others might be down to him. The violent deaths of Elizabeth Figg, an earlier victim on the towpath at Chiswick in 1959, and a body found in a shallow grave beside the towpath at Mortlake in 1963. It was variously identified as that of Tina Smart, Tina Dawson, Georgette Reese, and what turned out to be the real name, Gwyneth Reese. The police sifted through such evidence as they could find. Aged 22, Gwyneth, like the others, had come to seek her fortune in London, this time from Barry in South Wales. Naming the Pink Slip Girl, as the press had been calling her, turned out to be a triumph for forensics, since they succeeded in matching a sliver of skin with a fingerprint on file. In July, three months after Teddy Bartholomew, the body of another victim was dumped in a small road off Acton Lane in Chiswick. Berry Mead Road was close to all the other sites where bodies had been left, and once again the links were unmistakable. The girl's name was Mary Fleming. She was naked, she was a prostitute, and she was short in height. She was a provincial girl. She lived near the Bayswater Road. Her front teeth were missing. She had swallowed sperm. Her clothes had disappeared. And again, her body had minute speckles of paint on it. George Heard, a chauffeur who lived in the street, discovered her body. Well, I woke early this morning. What time? Uh, ten to five. Looked out of the bedroom window and saw what I thought to be a tailor's dummy in the right garage opposite. opposite. Behind yeah. where we're standing now? Yes. And uh, 
Oh, curiosity, I suppose. I went to have a look, saw that it was a body of a naked girl, went back indoors and quickly found a place. The clues were building up, but the police seemed to be no nearer discovering where the killer was hiding the bodies before dumping them, despite massive searches throughout London. Then, on the 25th of November, another body was found in a car park in Haunton Street, close to busy Kensington High Street. The familiar pattern was repeated with only slight differences in location, nearer to central London in Kensington and two miles north of the river. In all other respects, the same clues were there. The girl was a prostitute. She was short in height. A tooth was missing. She had been suffocated or strangled and there were the familiar paint specks on the body. But this time the victim had a connection to the rich and famous. Her real name was Margaret McGowan, but her working name was Frances Brown. And as Frances, she had played a small part in the era's great scandal concerning John Profumo, the Secretary of State for War who had shared the favors of Christine Keeler with a Soviet attaché. Margaret had given evidence at the trial of Stephen Ward, along with Christine Keeler and Mandy Rice Davis. Stephen Ward had been put on trial for living off the immoral earnings of Margaret's former flatmate, Vicky Barrett. Margaret bravely testified that he was a paying client, not a procurer. The jury believed her but their verdict of not guilty came too late for Stephen Ward. He had taken an overdose of Nembutal. Throughout London, the girls still plied their trade, but with increasing fear. The police were mounting a massive search and asking prostitutes to help them. The police were sure that all the victims had been hired, then murdered, then used for necrophilia, and their bodies hidden near a paint sprayer before being dumped at leisure. On the night she disappeared, Margaret had gone out with another girl, and they had been picked up at a pub by two men. Her friend was able to give a detailed description of Margaret's client and the police issued an identical picture, but he was never found. Yet more police were pulled into the case, but as one said, no sooner had we got down to one inquiry than the next one would start up. The last victim of Jack the Stripper was strangled almost a year after his first one. Early in the morning of the 16th of February 1965, an electrical fitter on his way to work on the Heron Industrial Estate in Acton spotted bright red toenails peeping out from a pile of bracken and grass in an alleyway. It was a familiar story. A girl on the game, short in height, dumped naked and ravaged. It was in the same area of London as the stripper's other dumping grounds, but this time was further away from the Thames and close to busy underground tracks. The map of West London was now dotted with six murders, all clearly by the same hand, and that was not counting a couple of possible earlier victims. This last victim was Bridget O'Hara, the eldest of 13. Bridie had come to London from Dublin, and her family had no idea how she was earning her living. She had disappeared on the 11th of January, and thus had been in the hands of her abductor, alive or dead, for at least a month. Her body was partly mummified, which suggested that it had been kept somewhere hot, perhaps by a fire or heated tank. Further searches were mounted to try to find a place which matched the clues. Posters were circulated.
a woman police constable was dressed in Bridie's clothes and photographed in the hope of jogging the memory of people who may have seen her being picked up. There were sightings in Shepherd's Bush and in Acton. Bridie had a basement flat there, not far from where she was found, and police searched every corner of it for clues and dusted it for fingerprints, but they found nothing to help them. With the dozens of detectives on the case getting nowhere, Scotland Yard recalled from holiday its most experienced investigator, Detective Chief Superintendent John Durose. One of his nicknames was Five Day Johnny, since he had a reputation for solving baffling cases amazingly quickly. Durose immediately requested the assistance of the 300 strong Special Patrol Group supplemented by 200 plain-clothed detectives and a further hundred from the uniformed branch. He got them all without an argument. Durose went back over the files of all six women that were without doubt the victims of the same killer and concentrated on the paint splashes on their bodies. He set his foot soldiers the task of finding their hiding place near a paint spraying plant. He moved them through an area of 24 square miles parallel with the Thames from Paddington to Acton and Chelsea to Chiswick and demanded to know details of every man who worked or lived there, what car he drove, whether he had the use of a spray gun and which ones worked at night. He sent women police dressed as prostitutes into the streets to question the men who tried to pick them up. Scotland Yard's assistant commissioner, Sir Ranulph Bacon, made a public appeal. Amongst those watching this program, there may be one of you at least who knows or strongly suspects the person responsible. If so, I'm speaking directly and personally to you. There could rest on your conscience the possible death of yet another young woman. I appeal to you to come forward and I can assure the utmost confidence and discretion to anything disclosed. Every kind of pressure was applied to the Yard's network of informers in the West End. A crackdown on vice was ordered, with leniency for those who agreed to help. Information earned generous inducements, and the girls on the game made up for some of their lost earnings from scared punters by selling gossip to the police. Working with the information supplied by forensics, Durose envisaged the murderer as a psychopath who demanded fellatio from naked women. Marks on their necks and mouths showed that he grasped their heads, both suffocating and strangling them. The whole resources of the Metropolitan Police were thrown into the task of locating the elusive murderer. To try to draw up a list of suspects, Durose placed a cordon around the western part of central London. Cars which crossed the series of roadblocks more than twice between dusk and daybreak were logged and all their drivers interviewed. Tempers frayed as cars were held up even during the day, but every driver in London was made aware of the yard's determination to catch the killer. The area was saturated with policemen.
The initial effect of this massive operation was the assembly of a huge amount of information which had to be logged and cross-referenced. Lists of hundreds of vehicles were prepared and the police set out to interview their owners. In particular, curb crawlers and men with records as habitual users of prostitutes found policemen at their doors. To spare them family embarrassment, the officers pretended to see them about an accident, but once alone, grilled them about the girls they knew and their alibis on the crucial nights. Gradually, all this activity paid off. A long list of suspects was steadily reduced to a very few possibles and coordinated with other investigations near the scenes of the crimes. The immediate benefit of the high-profile police presence was that the murders ceased. Now Duros moved in to identify the killer. The big break came a few weeks after the last murder. On the Heron estate, where Bridie O'Hara's body had been left, searching police found a pattern of paint at the site of a transformer which exactly matched the paint specks on the bodies. It was opposite a paint spray shop and established beyond doubt as the place where the bodies had been kept. Detectives saturated the area, making no secret of their presence. The 7,000 men who worked on the estate were questioned and the public were told that, by a process of elimination, the suspects were being whittled down. Duros had indeed quickly narrowed the number down to three and then to one. This was a security guard whose duty rota fitted perfectly with the murders. He was a quiet family man who lived in South London. But before he could be questioned, this man took his own life and thus was never formally charged. Police raided his house, but he was never named, partly out of consideration for his family and partly because under English law, a man is innocent until proven guilty. So the death of these six women officially went unpunished. But just as death came violently to them, so it did to their murderer, Jack the Stripper.